I'm really thrilled. My name is Jane Treger. This is the Deerfield Arts Bank. We're actually closed, but we opened specially for this event. And for uh, we had gallery space here and, and shows for two years. And uh, we just m had to reopen for these two people who came to visit. Um, I'm interested to know how, and I'll go around afterwards and find out, why you came, how you heard about this, and I see faces I've never seen before, so it's very exciting to me. Um, Marlis Glaser and her son Samuel Fisher Glaser uh, are from Germany. And um, all my notes are on the table in the living room. <laughs> no, I'll re I think I remember them. <laughs> Marlis, uh, 3 30? No. Otherwise, I should be here at 4. Marlis and, and Samuel, their work is, is different, but you'll see as you listen to them and you look at the work, you'll see some places where they intersect, interestingly. And I think it's, how many of us would not want a child of ours to be doing something extremely similar, some direction in life that is like ours, right? Others maybe not, but <laughs> I think uh, I think they can. Uh, they, I am proud for both of them. I think they must be both proud of each other. And um, Marlis's work started. I, I gave you this in case I forget uh, some important detail, and I'm sure I will. Uh, started uh, quite a while ago, back in the 70s. Um, uh, uh, and, her, and she took interest. Assis-toi ici, là, il y a une place. She uh, she started uh, um, her, the work she's going to present to you today. She calls the Abraham Project, and uh, she has. And you'll go look at her website. You you have these things, and you can you can get it later if you don't have it. She does lots of interesting work about women, about the labor movement, about uh, the kinder's transport, and, and, and uh, or, or rather not the kinder, but uh, Janus, Janus Korshak and, and how he stayed with his, his orphans. He was in charge of an orphanage, and he went off to the camps with them. And, but, but her focus today, and her focus for quite a while now, has been meeting, interviewing, and then responding to what she heard from a series of people who were emigres or refugees from Nazi Germany. And she does some interesting things. And you'll see it's not just portraits. It's quite a bit more complicated and interesting. Samuel is particularly interested in issues of relationships and where they fall apart and where they don't quite meet. And um, these are not the 330 people. <laughs> Neither is she. Oh, you're going to have to find a place to squeeze some people on the benches. Over there. Greta, over there. So, um, He's, uh, I, as I said, he's interested in the issues of relationship and where they fall short. That's a big subject. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's also interested in taking some works of literature and responding to them. So you're going to see that. To, to, you're going to see several examples of this kind of work. And he's primarily a sculptor, but both mother and father are Drawers, drawers, draw. They draw. <laughs> they draw. <laughs> what did I say? No, no, never mind that. Sorry, again, mother and son. Excuse me, Never mind the father. That's why he's working on relationships. You see. <laughs> 
Do we need air conditioning here? No. No. Okay. No. 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 Okay. No. All right. Come here. And uh, with that, I think I will stop. Anything that has to do with years and education, you're going to find a little bit more here or on their websites. That's. I prefer to look at the art, frankly. Oh, oh, me. Over here, uh, three catalogs of Marlis's work is over here for purchase if you wish. Um, food and drinks over here, coffee and, and cold and sweet and whatever. And uh, a poster that I'm giving away, and what else do I have to say? Discussion. And there will be, of course, room for questions and discussion afterwards. I have a feeling there's some people in the room, I feel it, who have some intimate connections to the subject. So, without further ado, Marlis Glaser. I forgot to say an important piece. Marlis is English. It's not too good. It's okay. It's great to talk like this, but on with pressure. Having to perform with pressure can be difficult. And uh, so I'm going to play a part of the interviewer here and keep it going. He's on his own. <laughs> so, okay. how do I do this? No. Yeah. 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 There. Okay, Abraham planted the tamarisk tree, um, which is about German-speaking survivors and immigrants in Israel, and their children, and some example of their grandchildren. Um, I started this art project in December 2005, in the winter, and uh, I had no idea how it would develop develop, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and ending or, or finishing in, 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 or have a reside in three catalog books and a lot, 22 exhibitions in Germany, Israel and France. Mm. So I couldn't imagine how it would grow and now you see some examples um, of what I've done. Oh, not I, I done it, but I was a part of a dialogue because this art project wouldn't exist. Um, um, if I had not a dialogue with people. And I think the dialogue is the best inspiration for my art. Um, yes, it's a challenge and it's a, 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 a gift, a treasure. So I, I went to Israel and I started to draw and to make photos and interviews. Before. And yes, I found four, for me, important things who transport, transport, who, who show you um, motif. Yes, motif about a personality, about life. And it was face, tree, name, and object. The most important, of course, is the face. Okay, I made my drawings, my skits, photos, and um, I asked, I put questions. Um, it's a tree. So the, 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 the four tree. motifs are face, tree, <coughs> name, and you can. I'm not sure. You can really. You, you can see. see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You can take your chair for the back. Maybe if you stand on the other side of the screen. Yeah. Move yes. back and yeah. forth. Yeah. Oh. Perfect. You don't have to hide. <laughs> it's so. It's okay. Yes. yes. Great. Great. Okay. So, I've chosen for you to present a portrait of Jacob because. The first, one of the first sentences he told to me uh, from Zerdin of his family, only five survived. Mm. These and are two portraits, Marlis? Two portraits, two different portraits. I present you yeah, Jacob and his daughter. Why his daughter? I was very interested in meeting in Israel my generation, but from the other side. 
I wanted to know how is the next generation, the second generation or grandchildren from the survivors and immigrants, I wanted to talk with them. Uh, and most of the survivors and immigrants, I talk with them German, but with the children, only English. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to know how I, now you have seen a painting and a drawing, and this is the second portrait drawing. You would like to know how I decide for the colors? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I visited them several times, and after this meeting, I had an impression about their personality. It, um, it depends from what they are wearing and what is in their room and which color they prefer, they like. And uh, Fritz Lisa was very often dressed in these colors, so they are all seen in the picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've chosen this portrait because later you will see her sister who didn't survive. She could come out of flee from Germany, but the sister didn't survive. Here's one of uh, one young person, young boy, who had the possibility to survive alone in the forest for more than two years. Marlis, why do you have all this writing? What is the writing about? As you can imagine, a young or old face is interesting, but what does it say? So for my exhibitions, I wanted that people could see, could read the name and the date of the birth and the place of where they from where they come, and some, maybe some sentences you say, say to me, it, skips, it gives more than only a drawing. So they're all identified. Ah. This is an example. Uh, first the drawing, and second um, the painting. And um, I read he died in Teresa instead, maybe of hunger. Um, I read letters from other person about his, his about Naftali Berlinger, and I read the letters he wrote the last days to his children, and he's such a warm-hearted personality. Uh, I've chosen in the center of the picture the warm colors, mm -hmm. and you see there are books, he's a book collector, and um, uh, Schmetterling, um, butterflies. butterflies, because he had a big collection of butterflies. Yes, and you see a symbol of because he's a here, he's a mohel, a mohel, circumciser. So, Pinchas, who came originally not far from where from where I come, uh, he took me to the mountains of the High Galil, and uh, so you can read, Pintras in Hohen Galil and High Galil. The Northern Galilee. Sorry, Marlis. <laughs> North, yes. Thank you. People can sit on the floor too if they want. Up here, there's room on the floor. <laughs> no, if I'm the standard, if you're under 67, you can sit on the floor. Still safe. If someone wants these seats, older people come here for seats, and you can sit on the floor here. She just got up to somebody else. There's only two. There's some seats over here. Like the salad No? No, it's all set up now. Oh, I see. There are some chairs, empty chairs. There's some chairs back there. There's some empty benches I see there. All right. So we finished with the faces. Face. And now we are in 
Where are we? Whoops, sorry. Objects. How, objects. how is this? I'm sorry. It's very sensitive. Very sensitive. Yeah. It's object. Some object. Object or stone, fruits, books, porcelain. Tell the story of this. This. This is beautiful Pinterest story. Told me one important impression or memory of his childhood was when he was small. Um, he was a long, when he was a little boy. He didn't uh, know exactly when its its birthday was, and he remembered that uh, his birthday was when this mirabel plum was ripened in August. So this was a, a month of his uh, birthday. <laughs> and another object. Well, oh, you can read it. Stone. You know, Memmingen, Memmingen is a place not far from uh, my home where I live. It's a city where there once a big Jewish community. Now there are four stones coming up. This is the first one. Um, oh, I don't know what happened there. What is the weight of a stone thrown into a Jewish home? Now, I didn't see this, but you had explained it to me. There is a, the stone is balanced on a wire or a rope. Why is that, Marlis? Well, it's just the biggest opposite you can imagine. I want to say the heritage, heritage of this memory, of this history, is forever too heavy. But we need to, to, to learn to to handle this. It's, it's, it's reality, it's our identity, and but it is very, very heavy. That's what I mean. So you know the important year, 38, where the synagogues were destroyed. So this is a painting, is that correct? Yes. And so you've painted a stone from this synagogue that was destroyed. Yes. Constance is Romania, right? No, Constance is it's all south of Germany <coughs> at the moment. Yes. Constance, it's, it's a lake of Constance. It's between Switzerland, Austria, and oh, Germany. And I'll read it. And Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head. He named the site Bethel, which means house of God. So would you say that this is how you work normally? You take an object and you, you go with it where it takes you? Is that what happens yes. to this piece Now, now you've seen some different aspects of stone. What does it mean, a stone? It has so different meaning. And one really inspiring context of a stone is this wonderful story about Jacob in the desert. and. Um, you, you, you know the sentence, I think. Yeah. Finally, this gives the impression of a wonderful morning, a sunny morning. Uh, somebody used a stone for his pillow, and uh, he was thankful to God. And this is absolutely the opposite to, to the uh, pictures before, to the stones. So it, it could be bigger uh, opposites and the contrast. Mm -hmm. uh, between this stone and the stones uh, before. Um, and it was clear when I work about German-speaking survivors and immigrants, I should know about uh, Jewish holidays, uh, about Jewish traditions, about uh, Jewish spirit, of course. So I included biblical aspects. Mm. So, so we've, we've done face, we've done object. This is name. Why, why is um, Esther Alsberg is one of your people you're interviewing? Yes. So you take her name and you, you did what here? Well, I knew Esther originally comes from Astarte. It's a Syrian name. It means star. And uh, Esther is also in Hebrew Hadassah. Mm -hmm. And Hadassah is a special plant. You can see it on the, mm. here on the left. And if this plant has flowers, it looks like a star, mm -hmm. so it uh, was a lovely game together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
We have an aster here. Is that related? Mm -hmm. Maybe? That's interesting. Uh -huh. Aster. aster. And it looked a little bit like an aster. Aster. Yeah. If, yeah. Let, let me interject. <laughs> if, you, if you were to see a lot of sunniness and eyes that are like this, what would that make you think? Happy. Laughter. Yitzhak, the name Isaac, means to laugh, to play. And it's, uh, it comes yes. Yes, from, the, from the biblical story of, of, of Sarah, who laughed when she was told she was going to have a child at, at some ungodly age. And so there it is. The sky is full of sunny, smiling eyes. Well, I ask you now, which tree can you see there? Which, which one? Oh, it's too high. No, it's not. <laughs> which tree? Which, there's a tree with rose, in rose color in one month. Yeah. Yeah. Apple. Yeah. Almond. Oh, Almond oh, trees oh, were well, very <laughs> important in history. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Avatar taught me her favorite tree is an uh, almond tree. And um, she told me about her life. She came as a child to Palestine. Her grandparents were killed. Her parents were killed. And she was an orphan in a home for orphans. And the name was, in the north of Israel, near Kiryat uh, Tivon. The name is Ahava. And Ahava means love. And so she talked about this, how, how she mourned, mourned, was suffering so long about the loss of her parents. But this home, this house, Ahava, was like uh, something who protect her. The shell. And that's why this, her favorite tree is in the shawl to protect the tree. In the shell. Shell. Beautiful. Shell. Yeah. The almond shell. So it was an idea to the composition. You have recognized the tree? Tell them. <laughs> Weeping willow. <laughs> this was the idea of uh, Beate. And, uh, so why do you have each picture and Beate planted a tree? She because didn't actually plant a tree, did she? Most people who arrived in Palestine had to plant a tree. <laughs> yeah. But it's, all, it's also a metaphor, of course. Yeah. Um, metaphor? Um, <laughs> sorry, yeah. I'm just making sure that... Yeah. Everything yeah. started with Abraham. He created the eternal in an abstract way. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you, this, this is a fundament mm -hmm. to learn how to think abstract. and. Um, he started there in this region, and each Jewish person who comes to this land is in this <coughs> continuity. And therefore, I have chosen, and Beate planted a tree, and Pintras planted a tree, and Miriam planted a tree. But the idea comes from the first book, uh, Genesis, Genesis, because there were a lot of parashot who are beginning with the, um, by, by a chi, and so on. It's and he did, and he did. So it's wonderful continuity to see it begins with Abraham and it's still today and well, I hope eternal. Mm -hmm. Is it a stethoscope? It's a, it's a symbol of her profession. Doctor. Doctor, yes. For Amos, the, the, the symbols of his uh, profession for him, it seems to me, were more important than the tree. So the tree in the center is small. It's uh, from an old Hebrew book of the Middle Age. Uh, he was a veterinary. veterinary mm -hmm. And I have, choose, have chosen uh, most of uh, animals who are named in the Bible. 
Maybe you never know how, how, a lot, how many animals are named in the Bible, because you can see he, he, he had nothing to do with a lot of uh, the veterinary, with uh, the most of the animals there. But this was uh, one aspect of... Uh, was that an ostrich? Pardon? Was one of the animals an ostrich? I didn't know yes, there would be an ostrich in the Bible. Ostrich. Yes, the yes. all in the Bible. So they are all called in the Bible. Well, and more, and more. <laughs> yes. Um, so after nearly, after 2012, I, I, I decided to finish because I could not always go two or three times in the year to Israel. Um, uh, I would have liked it, but it wasn't possible. So I had the idea for the next uh, exhibitions, I want to show people how look the refugees or survivors when they had to leave Germany, and especially, especially I make uh, guides when I have my exhibition, and uh, for young people, for pupils, and I want especially for Sam to show in which age these children had to leave Germany. Mm. And um, this is written zum Andenken an eure liebe Edith. She wrote this one month before they had to leave to her girlfriend. And uh, there are not so a lot to have uh, um, photos from their childhood. Only some have it. So this is one. Mm. This is from Ulm. He has to, to mm -hmm. leave alone. With eight years, he have, had to leave alone to United States. The mm -hmm. mother survived, but not the father. Yes. <coughs> this is sister of Friedlise Stern, you remember I told you. Um, the whole family was murdered. Uh, only if it is survived. Trees. Yes. Um, From a Hebrew book read printed in. Read. We can't read that. Yet. Oh. <coughs> oh. I don't know. In Vilma. Oh. Okay. Yeah, but I don't, I don't have the year. But that's okay. Okay. It's 1833. So. It's printed in, it says Vilma, but it's printed in Yosef. Yes. That's the, that's here. You're here. It's my son's help and inspiration. He has a really big collection of Hebrew books. And uh, he helped me in this project and he uh, inspired me and uh, he showed me some books who are important. And uh, this book um, once was printed in the Polish city, the Sefer. And uh, it was a big Jewish community. And uh, they had pr print, Falak. Uh, so it's a printer. printer. It's a printer. Yeah, okay. and, um, and in, so I wanted to, to remember once there was a big Jewish life in Europe, uh, but it's it was, new. It was completely wiped out by 1944. Yes. Mm. So, but I want to bring two things together, two ideas. Sorry, no, go back. Excuse mm. me. Yes. The book was saved by Samuel. And um, I, it's one picture. I painted a tree who is in Chavez Sion, and I painted the flowers who are on the front side. It makes a, a kind of unification with this history and the present now, because I wanted to show it's a past and it's horrible, but the life goes on, and uh, Israel is there, and there are plants. And there's life. So. It's also from his book collection. Um, the first, maybe it's the first print, or you know, or wood print, with the name Eschel. Eschel means tamarisk tree. And um, the this silhouette is a typical silhouette of. Um, tamarisk trees in Jabetir and whole Israel. So it's only it's a silhouette. And behind it's um, uh, a spiritual world 
um, included in, in, in a book and I wanted to show this book is from 18th century, 18th, um, century. 18, no, 18th century. No, 18th century. <laughs> Printed 1774. 18th century. 18th century, yes it is. And um, so I wanted to, to show, I started with this idea, Esso means tamarisk tree, and um, uh, it symbolizes this, this uh, story about uh, Abraham when he planted a tamarisk tree. Excuse me, and lifts our leaves and dried its water. What? Sorry. What is the symbolism of the tamarisk tree? Is it only indigenous? To Israel. Interesting. Is it Come on in all tamarisk tree? You can sit in the front. You can sit on the floor. We have room here in the front. It, it, it's a first. Sorry. It's a first special tree who is named in the Bible. There's not so before because it's the first book of Bereshit or Genesis. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree, so you cannot read a, spe a name of a special tree before. And the tamarisk tree, it's a, it's a biblical symbol, and on the other side, it's a, it's a tree which they planted in Shabbat Zion uh, because they needed shadow. They shade. needed um, shade. 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 Yes, uh, and it grew very quick. He doesn't need uh, a good ground, mm -hmm. and um, it was like a fence because from the first day they were attacked from Arab terrorists. So they had a different function. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, this is a wonderful tree in Shabbat and I wanted to show, it's not a biblical tree, but I wanted to show such a lot of energy within this tree. He's a, symbolize Israel uh, because I want to show um, how, how <coughs> much we can enjoy, how much we can be content that Israel exists and it grows and they have plants and wonderful trees and it's a wonderful land with future and uh, this is a wonderful color of magen mag magenta magenta yes. Which brings us to the end of of Marlis's <coughs> show, and a reminder that catalogs with many, many more pictures are available over here. So. And now, it, and now, and now it's your turn. But I will, uh, you know, make a complaint first of all. I was being, I was told there were going to be thirty people at most. So <laughs> two thirds. Half of you will have to leave. <laughs> that, would yeah. that would be nice. Anyway, you want the lights off? Yes. Okay. Oh yeah, that would be. Yes. Okay. And for, for those of you who can't see in that corner, please move to another corner. Yeah, it's easier said than done. <laughs> okay, or come up front. Now, before he uh, starts speaking. Much better. Much worse. <laughs> <laughs> much better. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this, um, this is actually one of the uh, first pieces or, you know, series of works that I've done that are based on pieces of literature. This one consisting, you, you, you know, you, uh, this is a small part of... Ah, okay. <laughs> this is a small part of that series, which is based, which I made uh, two, three years ago, which is based on um, Franz Kafka's last novel, uh, unfinished novel, uh, The Castle, which I know a lot of people aren't familiar with. Um, it, you know, just on a plot level, a man comes into a village, the village uh, belongs to a castle, the castle is apparently filled with officials that deal with paperwork all day, and everybody in the, in the village you know, doesn't talk about anything else basically than the castle and the officials. And going from that, what I took from that is, is really um, the spirit 
of um, the unifying spirit of um, of a secret, of a shared secret, a secret and a shared drive. That, in this case, isn't to be talked about because the secret. What's the nature of the secret? The secret is not something that nobody knows. The secret is something that everybody knows, but nobody talks about. <laughs> And that's what the castle, my series, the castle is about. <laughs> the wait a bit, one okay. second. Okay. That was just a. No, no. You tell me. Um, and one of the things that are, one of the objects or one of the people that are most talked about in the in the village is Clum. He is one of the officials. He is one of the high-ranking officials from the castle. He is also one of the few officials who regularly go into the village and reside in the inn, um, but his nature is that that he can't be seen, he's, you know, nobody's allowed to see him. He resides in a separate room in the inn, he can only go outside when there's nobody around, he um, doesn't issue, he doesn't, he, he doesn't act, he's, not, he's not, not an active character, but his actions or inactions are you know, generally talked about a lot. So he has more the, you know, not the nature of a person, but more the nature of a, of a totem, of a fetish, which is how I chose to, to you know, depict him, not as, a, not as a man with two legs, two arms, a head, but as this sort of in-between, everything at once, aunt, giraffe, horse thing with three <laughs> legs. You know, different people see different animals here. Um, <laughs> And this is, this is what came out. Very static as well, you know, not a lot of movement going on there, because I don't think this figure is a, a live figure. What you see there in the background are three of the, uh, I think in total, 19 uh, collages that I made, uh, sort of big scale. Um, they all relate, you can do the next one, they all relate to specific characters from the novel. And they're grouped, you know, when, they're, when it's shown in its original form, they're grouped around this sculpture. Are these collage? They are. Paper? Sorry? Paper? Col paper? Paper, collage. paper collage, yeah. <coughs> now what other materials do you use for 3D sculpture? Well, so far I've mostly used uh, cloth, textile, and you'll see that. And um, I am right now moving away from that. What's or the armature? I'm sorry? What armature do you use? What, what material do you use for the armature? Ah, they, they all, they all have, a, have, a, have a sort of metal skeleton. They all have a or the wooden skeleton and then, you know, they're wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped in many layers of, of cloth and held together by string mostly. This is, a, this is one, one uh, piece of work that's, uh, that relates to the story of Belshazzar from the Book of Daniel, and uh, the one phrase that most people know from that from that particular story is "mene mene teke uferzin," the writing on the wall, mm -hmm. which translates to "weighed, weighed, counted, and found lacking." And it's this rhythm of four that is reflected here in these in these figures, and it is the characterization. Can you say those four words again, Stella? Weighed, weighed, counted, and found lacking. Found too light. And this, as a characterization of a person, I think is quite brilliant, quite succinct. And this person that I've tried to, actually you can do the next one because there's, you can see one of them here. I've tried to reflect that. Sorry? What's the size? I like this. I've tried to, to reflect that in, in, in the, you know, in the position, in the, in the, What's how do I say that? The pose. The, the, yeah, the pose. pose yeah. Yeah. And the pose of these figures, you know. Reclining but not comfortable. Um, always sort of on edge and with a you know big with these crossed legs, which as a you know, as a gesture, uh, creates a huge distance between yourself and the other. And it, it closes off. And this this, you know, um, close off nature of this, of this personality is really what this is about. It's somebody who, who has no, <coughs> no weight, no moral personal weight, nothing for the other person to hold on to. Mm. Somebody who will withdraw from, um, from any intimate, dangerously intimate contact with another being. Mm. Ah yeah, that's mm. not one of my works, but that is... <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, oh, well, you know what, it's a ready-made. It is one of my works now. Um, no, actually it is a, it is a prompt uh, for a, it's a point mm -hmm. you know, where I started. I started working on something on a project that's called The Clean Country and it started two years ago and it's still not done. I still haven't found its final shape, I still haven't found its final form that I'm content with and that encapsulates you know, what I'm trying to say. But this is where it started. I live in Munich. I have been living in Munich for almost four years now. And um, I live right next to the main station and from the main station all the suburban trains, they start there. Mm -hmm. And one of them is the S2, which goes to Dachau. Mm -hmm. And for hundreds and hundreds of people living in Munich and around Munich, every day, that's just, you know, commuters. They take that train every day, they take it to work or they take it back home, and don't think anything of it. And for me, I just, I'm just guessing here. Why would they? Why would, you know, it would make, it would make their lives, sorry, one second, it would make their lives very, very hard, I think if they thought about this every time they, they went on that train. For me, because I only had to take it once or twice, I did experience the whole, you know, it was very strange and very unpleasant for me to take, a, to take the train that says Dachau in the front. And I connected it to something else, to a, a song from the Krakow Ghetto, written by uh, Mordechai Gebirtik, which some people, who some people might know. He was a, um, a folk composer in Poland in the 20s and 30s, quite well known, and he was, <coughs> Uh, yeah. In 1942 or 41, he was deported as a Jew to the Krakow ghetto, and he was shot in 1943 during a raid. And in 1942, he wrote a poem or a song called Minuten von Bitochen, Moments of Certainty. And the third stanza of that poem or song ends with the lines. Kehren soll sein Kehren, Kohl's Manier wird sein, sie sind Sistos Kehren, Svetonis werden rein. You tell us to sweep the streets, we will sweep, but as long as you, you obviously being the Germans, as long as you are, all, all our sweeping will be in vain, this place will not be clean. And this, and you know, what is the message of this? For me, for me, the message of that is a very simple fact, which is that everything is always there, everything is always present, what has been is always is always present and it is especially present when you have the word you know sort of shoved, shoved in your face as you do when you board the train to Dachau mm -hmm. yeah and I've, as I said I've been working on this for almost two years now these are some you know drawings um, that I've done relating to that they're still not the final form but they have the words uh, the lines from the poem in there. de rein. This place will not be clean. The one that you just saw had the line. Sissen sistos kehren. All all sweeping is in vain. So that's that. Oh yeah, and obviously these are the, the Yiddish words they're written in Hebrew, as as they are in the original, as Gebirtik would have uh, would have written them. I find it interesting that these are very reminiscent to me of the black and white collages we just saw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would be very <coughs> interesting if you interviewed those people on the train going to Dachau mm -hmm. and what they would tell you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yes. I took that train and I didn't see that it said Dachau. Mm -hmm. And I had a very strong reaction. Yeah. And where, as soon as I saw the train and Dachau, it came right back. It said, you're seeing Germany that's gone beyond, that's trying to come back. Yeah. My husband was not born Jewish, so his non-Jewish relatives would point out interesting historical sites. Yeah. And I was, so I was coming from that feeling, you know, Germany is it's accepting, it's not putting yeah. it underground anymore. And then I saw the sign, just a plain simple sign, that said Dachau. Yeah. And that's one of the most impressionable spots that I've mm -hmm. had in my life. So yeah. when you, I am not. Yeah. For me, it's, I had a very strong reaction to it uh, because I genuinely feel that if Germany was a genuinely civilized nation, 
there would be no Dachau anymore. People wouldn't be able to live in, in, a, in this place. Dachau would be a deserted wasteland and there certainly wouldn't be a train running there. This is something completely different. This is a, a very recent work and it comes from the place of frustration with sculpture. Uh, it's, um, it's called Childless Saturn. Mostly because of the... Saturn? Saturn, sorry. Childless Saturn. Mostly because, you know, once I'd finished it, I, I realized the similarity be between that and the, one of the black paintings by Francesco de Goya, Saturn eating his children. But that's, a, you know, that's a formal reminiscence for me. Other than that, it remains fairly cryptic to myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it like this. Also, also, as a little, um, you know, game for you to play. You see this. You will find this in this room here. I've, I've, because I brought a small piece of a sculpture here to the US, and I'm going to leave it somewhere around. Um, and right now it's still in this room, so. <laughs> It's a game of hide and seek now. It'll be in New York or Chicago? Yeah. Mm. Ah, yeah. This, <coughs> no learning, no hugging. <laughs> Some of you might know that phrase. It's, it's fairly well known if you, um, if you follow a certain, um, another literary, let's call it another literary, um, uh, inspiration. It's the 90s sitcom Seinfeld, <laughs> and um, I take that as one of the you know greatest pieces of literature to come out of out of the last century because I feel very I feel very strongly about it. And um, one of the one of the two main writers it was Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David who then went on to do you know Curb Your Enthusiasm, the Larry David show. Uh, he summed up the show in these two, in these four words: no learning, no hugging. That was a, his characterization of the four char main characters of the show, uh, who you know didn't learn from their mistakes. There was no personal development there, and they didn't hug. There was no, none of them were able to build any, to build any intimate, close relationships with anybody, and they didn't have any with their families or their parents or their siblings or their friends or their, you know. The people that they were in, in relationships with, there was no no hugging, there was no inter, in, intimacy there anywhere to be found. And you will see the similarity between that figure and the Belshazzar figures because, you know, the the person that's being described here, the the, the character that's being described here, is fairly similar to Belshazzar, in in, in his way of withdrawing from relationships, or actually not even entering them in the first place, of, of complete protection against any, you know, any touch, any intimate touch, be it physical or, or psychological. Also, I have, a, I have a slight problem myself now with this, with this work, which is the, the, the typography of the writing. To me, it doesn't fit the sculpture entirely anymore, but what it does, you know, what it achieves quite well is it limits the space of the sculpture even more. It's, in, it's, uh, it's a site-specific work. It was built for this exact, uh, it was made for this exact corridor. Um, and the, as I said, the writing limits this very limited <coughs> space even more. Where is so this? Where is it's, this? In a, um, it's in an art space uh, an hour from Munich. I was invited to, to uh, do work for that a uh, year and a half ago. No. Yeah. Ah, yes. This is something different. This is something completely new. I made this two, three weeks ago. <laughs> and again, this is, I mean, it is a very abstract work. It's very much about the surface of things. And because I've discovered a completely new material for myself. It is still, you know, within the realm of textiles, but it carries new connotations. It's shower curtains. <laughs> <laughs> because they carry, they carry within them so many beautiful and interesting connotations of privacy and nudity and protection against the eye of the other, 
and also of you know personal grime and filth <laughs> and you know subjects of hygiene and of of cleanliness and of dirtiness so that's I'm, I'm exploring that now <laughs> Ah, yeah, and this one actually relates to Seinfeld as well. Um, it's called "I Love You, Jerry," <laughs> which is a direct, which is a direct quote. Um, and this is not not so much. It's George who says that to uh, to Jerry. You. Um, and this is not even not even so much about the about the phrase "I love you, Jerry," but as it is about. Jerry's reaction, which is one of complete <laughs> disgust and <laughs> withdrawal and, um, and fear, existential fear. And I combine it here with this, gest this, this gesture of you know, reaching around, holding somebody, which to me is a, very, is a, is a gesture that, that, that I personally react to very ambivalently because it, you know, there's also something fairly possessive and intrusive about it. You get, whether you want it or not, you, you get very close to the other person and you take them. It can be very pleasant, it can be very unpleasant. So, ambivalence. Can, can I, um, for those of you who saw the exhibit at the Mead, may I make the connection? Yep. Kent, uh, Kent Bridge? Did Kent, Kentridge, William Kentridge. William Kentridge, did any of you see that exhibit? It was quite extraordinary. Um. Mm. No, it was these drawings that were made on pages, and then it was a film put together, and you, mm -hmm. and you had these people moving across text, mm -hmm. but here it's across a shower curtain. And this reminds me of, and, then, and I brought him a, a catalog of it, because I thought he might be interested. He said, that's a very important influence for me. Yeah. I would close with this one and not even say that much about it. It's called The Blessing. <coughs> and I made it two years ago. Drawing is something that's always been there for me. I've always done that with everything, alongside everything else that I've done. And, you know, different people see different things in it. Quite a lot of people see a family in there. I see an arm going around the person. Yeah, mm. two, two, two arms. Two arms. Yeah. But there's no touching. No touching. Up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You've seen a dance? Yeah. 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 Yeah.